Ultimately, it's about changing people's attitudes and their behaviors. So we've got them into the sort of captive state where they are more willing to mobilize. ProfMed Future Professional. Shared values. One future. Ulrico, awesome to have you in your colorful jacket in studio today. <laughs> Good to be here. Thanks, I think it's Mike. incredible. And uh, I think it's also, we were talking off air just about some of your recent travels. It, it, it speaks to me of of pan-African influence. I know that there's been some work or upcoming work in Rwanda. I know that there's a whole host of impact. You've captured snow leopards. You're working with gorillas and chimpanzees. You occasionally work with human beings. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's an illustrious CV that you've built up over the last few years. Tell us about Habitat XR. It's mind-blowing. It's like Elon Musk telling us that we're living in a simulation. Go, go into more detail. <laughs> sure. So Habitat XR is, uh, we call it an impact-led immersive experiences studio. And our overarching mission is to use immersive storytelling as a tool for creating impact and reconnecting people to nature. So everything we do and have been doing for the past five, six years is uh, exploring that territory and using this, this sort of fringe technology to make people feel things uh, ironically through technology about nature. So yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's the interesting thing, right? Is that people talk about these buzzwords. They talk about storytelling. They talk about impact. They talk about whatever the latest marketing trend is with your why and your purpose. But for you, you're actually going into territories. You're creating the content. And then you're serving that content to people through headsets and modern day technology to emotionally connect between your target audience yeah, sometimes yeah. people like donors mm. and then you're bringing that closer to wallet to make people want to invest in making a change that's the real impact right absolutely yeah ultimately it's about changing people's attitudes and their behaviors so we've got them into the sort of captive state where they are more willing to mobilize uh you know towards some sort of cause and that could be you know donating to a conservation nonprofit. it could be you know putting a headset on politicians or, or policy makers lawmakers and changing regulations that protect nature so there there are several different ways that impact can be an outcome of immersive storytelling and immersive experiences and yeah i think like you say you know uh, impact is a very subjective word uh, a lot of people throw it around but we're trying to be very um, accountable to being able to measure impact and actually create campaigns that change something tangibly. And virtual reality is a great technology because if we take it back to the corporate of today, so many people have now migrated to virtual recordings, virtual meetings. And if we look at it in the sense that now it is possible to take a team to Rwanda for the day, for the afternoon. You're able to go and meet gorillas as if you are there in the flesh. It allows yeah. the opportunity to almost create team building opportunities, but also emotionally connect teams a lot closer in this modern day and age. So let's use one of your real world examples. Let's let's talk about how you met Ellen and uh, <laughs> a bunch of celebrities and red carpets <laughs> and fundraising. I think that's a great story. Let's let's give everyone a little bit of a, a background on what happened down there. Yeah, so uh, we were approached by uh, the Ellen Fund um, through their partnership with the Dan Fossey Gorilla Fund. So they partnered up in Rwanda to protect mountain gorillas in that area. And so we were invited to head up to Rwanda and go and trek wild mountain gorillas and, and film them and capture them in, in 360 so that a whole bunch of other people could experience what we experienced up on that volcanic mountain. Um, we weren't initially meant to go to LA and at the last minute they invited us saying, please bring as many headsets as you possibly can. And yeah, I mean, next thing we, you know, trying to set up these headsets, the doors open and the Kardashians are walking in and Leo DiCaprio is walking in and you know, Julia Roberts is walking in and it's just, it's, it's a very, very surreal memory. But I think what's so incredible about it is that Ellen uh, saw what VR can be beyond just being a gimmick. And a lot of people who've experienced VR before have kind of seen it and experienced a roller coaster experience or some sort of, you know, uh, Jurassic Park thing. Um, and, you know, I think what's amazing is she saw that it could be a tool for impact. So what she wanted to do in that particular fundraiser is, is establish the context of what she wanted to protect. So we had 400 A-list Hollywood celebs putting on headsets and spending five to six minutes with wild mountain gorillas. And if you've never experienced VR before, um, you know, the amazing thing that happens and where the, the content differences between traditional media and VR is that the person's mind experiences the state of what we call telepresence. So telepresence is the mind's belief that the body is physically somewhere else. 
um, and all of a sudden, physiologically, things change in your body. So if I put a headset on you and a, and a gorilla starts walking up to you, if I measured your heart rate, your skin response, your brain activity, uh, it would that, that data would be indistinguishable from the real experience. And that's really the golden opportunity. And so she understood that and it was a super successful campaign. They raised $5 million in a single what? evening for guerrilla conservation. Yeah. And I think it goes back to that emotional connection. So, you know, we become more digital savvy as, as a species, mm. but the reality is that we're also a little bit desensitized Big to time. stuff we see on National Geographic, the stuff we see on the news, violence, successes, joys, but ultimately, it's the emotional connection and those bonds that help you dig into your pocket and say you want to make a change. Yeah. So yeah. there's obviously there's the there's the NGO kind of aspect, but on the business front, like if you're working with a broker and he can almost show you the future and the vision of what your savings and your investments mean yeah. for your personal wealth and your mm. personal growth and what that means for your family. Uh, as an architect, you could almost take people on a visual journey of what their home is going to look like, what their office park is going to look like. Yeah. Like these are really amazing technologies to not just throw out the buzzword of storytelling, yeah. but to actually allow you to inception it and yeah. to immerse yourself in that environment. Absolutely, you, you become a witness. So it's the difference from being a viewer and becoming a witness. And be, when you become a witness, those experiences are real. They're digital, they're virtual, but they're actually real to you as a real human being. Um, and that's where the usefulness of VR and the other technologies in this immersive technology sort of toolbox come from. So talk us through almost like Ulrika on a monthly basis. Are you constantly involved in projects? I believe you were one of the first human beings to capture snow leopards. Right. What, what happened there? Yeah, that was a, a, a fascinating campaign for the United Nations Development Program out in India. So they've got a, a challenge up there in that uh, in, in northern India, in the sort of Himalayan mountain range, they've got a lot of human wildlife conflict that takes place because you've got villagers, who have got goats and cattle and yaks, and these animals are being attacked by the snow leopards, by the bears, by the wolves out there, and so they're poisoning them. Um, but they are, these animals are incredibly rare. Their habitats have been demolished over the last 50, 100 years. And so the campaign was kind of exploring that human wildlife conflict specifically for lawmakers and policy changes um, so that they could witness what's going on out there, meet the villagers, but then also come kind of nose to nose with these wild animals. And so the snow leopard was an insane break uh, of like everybody who works out there and who does camera trapping of snow leopards said it's absolutely impossible. And here these two Joburg oaks coming along <laughs> with this lofty idea that we're going to film snow leopards pretty much manually, uh, one of the most elusive animals in the entire world. And uh, we fantasized about, about filming them that entire shoot. And every night we said, hey, if nature wants us to tell the story, the, the door is going to open. And on the very last day of the shoot, we had this old village guy come knock on the door uh, and sort of articulate with his hands that there was something weird going on up on the slopes. And so we uh, we hiked as far as we could possibly get, pulled out a scope and saw these snow leopards uh, on an ibex kill. Uh, and what we try and do when we film wildlife is we, we kind of try to tap into the natural behaviors. And so we know from the common African leopards that those leopards will usually feed and then move away, go drink water and then come back to their kill. So we said, hey, if these guys do that, I will trek up this mountain at all costs and I'll get a camera down next to that ibex and try and film these snow leopards. It's exactly what happened. They moved off onto the rocks, hiked up there, um, pretty much passed out. I mean, we're talking, I think it was 16 or 17,000 feet, uh, got a camera up there and by just sheer, you know, uh, luck and uh, technological stars aligning, we were able to actually film 45 minutes of these three snow leopards approaching back down to that kill, feeding, interacting with each other. It's just absolutely mind-blowing. And then what happens with that? Does it get converted to a virtual reality program? Does it go to National Geographic? Like, What happens with that content and, and what is the, the purpose of it? So the tricky thing with that kind of uh, form of filmmaking is that we use specialized cameras that point in all directions at the same time. And so that allows a person in a headset to be able to look around and feel like they're physically present. So that content doesn't translate well to traditional TV screens. So normally what happens is we create these you know, experiences, they've got a voiceover, there's a bit of context to the story, and they then use that events, they use that you know, meetings um, in combination with those headsets. So you know, in the past we've done things for uh, tourism agencies, for example, 
you know, exploring South Africa, exploring Rwanda, like you said, they'll take headsets instead of brochures to a travel in Daba. Yeah, a lot more attractive than a, than a piece of paper. So much more attractive. And, you know, it, it's always fascinating going to these experiences where you've got sort of like, you know, Democratic Republic of Congo stand next to South Africa stand and people are queuing outside the South Africa stand and there's nobody inside the Congo stand because people are curious. Um, people are having a good time and reacting as if they're physically, you know, you know, flying above the low crons uh, bridge and yeah it's just fascinating to watch that too yeah and i think that's also once again it's a great analogy for the future of business and we're in the future of that right now because you know that's a, a real life tourism analogy and i think so many of our professionals that are listening and tuning in our brokers they're used to those kinds of experiences where you go to a road show there's a brochure with that stapled business card but that is a very detached way of being able to communicate to that audience yeah. whereas what you're saying immersive storing immersive storytelling is just that it puts you at the heart of that experience and you can generate fears, interests, loves, sweatable moments, you know, and I think that that's a quite an exciting opportunity to be able to incorporate that thinking into multiple professions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it, it really can do that. Um, and they're and they just so many use cases now, you know, a lot of people think of VR as a new technology, but it's been around for the last seven, eight years. And so that time has allowed, you know, people like us to explore how to make it useful. Uh, and, you know, the pandemic has kind of flipped that onto its head too, right? That, you know, people can't travel, people can't be in the same physical space as each other. It has been incredible seeing how virtual reality is becoming a tool to, to bring people within proximity to each other. Uh, you know, an example of that is uh, uh, an event that we, we produced last year, normally takes place in the real world. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a wildlife festival takes place in Durban and they were looking at canceling the whole festival. And we said to them, look, there's this new technology out here we've been looking into called social VR. And so social VR basically puts people into a virtual environment they can walk around and explore, but they are represented as, physic as avatars of themselves and so are all the other people around them. And so you're running around with 300 other avatars and you can speak to them in real time and experience these incredible environments. So, you know, instead of the keynotes taking place at Sanson Convention Center or the, you know, uh, Durban Convention Center, you're in a, a jungle ruin, you're in a bioluminescent cave, you know, and so it, it unlocked all this incredible potential. We shipped uh, all these headsets uh, across the world to people in India, North America, throughout Africa. And so there were people in their, you know, apartments and houses locked up, putting on a headset and teleporting them into this incredible collaborative environment. So it's been amazing to see. Do you think that we'll ever see a full immersion into VR? Like a la The Matrix. Do you think we'll ever be <laughs> one day become plugged in after we've destroyed the world and we've uh, got nothing left, we'll basically immerse ourselves in a new reality that uh, allows us to build and construct and design and develop anything that we want. Yeah, that. yeah, Ready Player One vibes. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, Elon Musk believes that we're already there, uh, that, that that happened long ago. Um, I've kind of given up with making predictions uh, in this world. Things change so fast. Uh, there's so many quotes about things I've said two, three, four years ago that have, you know, been, the, the whole industry has completely pivoted to a different direction. So, uh, yeah, I don't know, um, but we're just going with the flow. Do you have a full time dedication to NGO work and wildlife conservation or do you almost straddle the worlds of business and commercial for certain needs of your clients? And then obviously those requirements from a, of a world kind of conservation perspective. Yeah, so we started out in the commercial world um, and only doing commercial. Um, and, you know, it's it's a fascinating place and space to be in because every brief is different and every client's got a completely different need. Uh, at the same time, I was kind of feeling like they, I, I needed a bit more fulfillment in my life. And so we started a division that explored that. And, and part of the reason we, we came up with Habitat is because all these incredible commercial campaigns we we're working on would sometimes take us to these pristine wildernesses, you know, when you work with, for the luxury lodges, for example, you know, they want to be able to show people what a remote camp in, you know, Tanzania looks like and feels like in the hospitality uh, that isn't just a brochure. And so when we're out in these places, we've just seen this, um, you know, rampant destruction of the natural environment in almost every single place we've been to. Uh, and that has kind of inspired us to use our niche, our specialization as sort of a tool for good. And as we experimented more and more with this division, Habitat XR, we started realizing it's actually where we want to focus our efforts full time. Um, and, you know, in the in the long term, 
really around environmental education. Um, and part of that as well is that we've, we've been out there, we've seen these things, we've felt like watching these BBC documentaries of pristine wildernesses and, you know, the blue whales are thriving out there. Um, hasn't, it's not really the case. And so, yeah, it, it seems to us that the, you know, people talk about the sixth mass extinction taking place right now. And when we've been out there, everything that's been said has held true. Uh, you know, they're talking about 68% loss of biodiversity in the last 50 years on earth. So um, that we've just, we feel this compulsion to be part of that fight. And so we just said, the commercial stuff is great. The money's really good, but we have to help somehow. It's the only mass extinction that we've had in our control. So we might as well try to do something about it. And is your business purely bootstrapped and you've evolved as you've grown per project or did you raise funds? Like where did you, how did you get to where you are today? Um, through your own sheer grit and determination or did yeah. you have uh, external support? No, it's all, all bootstrapping. Um, yeah, we've just sort of uh, you know, shed a lot of blood, sweat and tears to, to kind of get through to this point. Um, I think what, what was really great for us is that we kind of fell into virtual reality in the early days. So we were one of the very first players in the country and the continent uh, in that space. So yeah, we, we effectively bootstrapped uh, this whole time. So the, the commercial VR studio started in 2014 and we've kind of just used uh, profits to, to build and scale and, and kind of pivot from there. Um, but I think what was lucky is that we kind of fell into VR in the beginning. We were sitting around a boardroom table with a bank and spitballing all sorts of different technologies that could be used. And they said, uh, we've heard about this thing called virtual reality. Is that something you guys do? And I had a concept of what it was. So uh, of course I said, yeah, we, we're doing a lot of that these days, um, all the time really. And uh, they took the bait and commissioned us to do a, 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 you know, a campaign and we figured quite a bit of stuff out. and. We decided this is super cool. Not a lot of people seem to be doing this. Set up a website and suddenly we're ranking number one for VR in South Africa. A lot of people were searching for it because it was doing well in PR. And uh, the phone kind of never stopped ringing. So yeah, that, that's how we got started. Um, awesome, man. Yeah, that's awesome. incredible. And I think what's, what's really interesting and a little bit of a change of tact is is looking at technology such as hologram technology. Mm. We've seen recently like Tupac appeared at... Uh, at a music ceremony, uh, back from the dead, performing as if he was there in real person. Right, uh, right. Also Cisco with some of their more commercial, more B2B technologies that they've rolled out. Uh, what is your take on holograms and, and what kind of work are you doing on that front? Yeah, I mean, holograms fit beautifully within this kind of tool chest of immersive technologies. Um, and and there have been some very exciting advances in, in that uh, hardware. So for example, there's a company called The Looking Glass. Um, you know, so The Looking Glass is a slab of glass. And what's so cool about it is it's not just a photorealistic uh, computer generated model that, you know, seems like it's got depth inside that little block of glass, but it's interactive. So there's a sensor that can track your fingers. And for example, with this frog, when you wave your fingers, you know, in front of it, the eyes track your fingers. Oh, wow. And if you stop moving your finger, it then lashes its tongue out and kind of, you know, simulates feeding a uh, fly. And so it brings to life a lot of opportunity. You know, kids go to zoos, for example, they bang on the tanks because they want that, that feedback from, you know, the poor snake or turtle or whatever it is in the tank. But we can now kind of generate that, um, that those moments using holograms. So I think they're very powerful. Especially from an education perspective, like you say, you'd, you'd much rather have a, a virtual frog licking the fly as opposed to those animals being banged on and try and get some kind of attention from them. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, obviously back into the boardroom, it gives you an opportunity. People are traveling less based on the pandemic. There are more virtual board meetings. We've seen even our politicians, they've embraced the technology to have their weekly Zooms and to keep themselves accountable. Now yeah. you can physically be in someone's presence virtually. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that, um, I think there's so many opportunities to think about technology always is built for a certain purpose, but then it's the users that define how that is evolved to the use case, right? Absolutely. So you found a perfect niche within telling emotional, immersive storytelling from an NGO perspective to raise money. Like there's a clear business objective that's being met off the back of that. Mm. But alternatively for some of our listeners and, and watchers out there, yeah. they get to see how, you know, it's simple innovations and simple techniques. We've seen Google have those little cardboard foldouts that you literally put your, your smartphone in and put your headset on and then you're able to experience, obviously not as, as professionally as your headset, but it gives you a slightly better experience than you would have from a flat, regular screen. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the thing is that technology is sometimes intimidating to a lot of people who don't work in that space. 
Um, but the the best use of technology is always a simple use case. And so it's, you know, for example, with the holograms coming back to that, you know, you can, uh, as an engineering firm or an architectural firm, you can preview and see physical components before you've even started manufacturing them to try and, you know, see if they're going to be any flaws or, or see how, how it kind of uh, reacts with other components. So all of it really is there to achieve a specific need. And I think the lack of physical proximity in this new, you know, post-pandemic world we're living in, um, these technologies are coming front and center stage. So it's really just about exploring usefulness and value. So Rico, tell us, I mean, if there's one key message that you want to leave the audience with today, like, is it a save the earth message? Is it a improve your business message? Like, what's the, what's the key takeout that you want the professionals of South Africa to almost open their minds to? Yeah, good question. I mean, I think with, with where our hearts are aligned, you know, as a, as a business, as Habitat XR, is just that, uh, you know, we rely on nature far more than we think we do. Everything is absolutely interconnected. And, uh, you know, changing the culture of how we consume and, and uh, approach nature is, is an incredibly important thing for our own wellness. So I think it's just, uh, you know, everyone has a part to play. We've, we've learned that. If people want to reach out and throw some money at you and the causes that you're involved in, what's the best way to find you? Google, yeah. Yeah, go- social Google, media? Google, social media, Facebook, Instagram, we're at Habitat XR. Uh, yeah, all one up, word, Habitat all XR. One, ex- one word, yeah. Keep up to date with what we're doing and uh, the initiatives that we kind of have close to our hearts, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. I think that's the important lesson really is that there can be a lot of buzzwords out there in various marketing departments. We can talk about storytelling, we can talk about find your why, but Ulrico's managed to marry those things in a real world setting that has direct impact. He's realizing the effect on nature and the effect on our reality and he's using a virtual reality to impact that support business objectives, and ultimately bring change to those natural habitats and communities in need. Ulrico, thanks so much. Thank you, Mike. ProfMed Future Professional. Shared values, one future.